All right, so next we have uh, Max. No slides. Come back. No slides, all right. <laughs> Thank you for tolerating uh, my absence of scientific slides. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I founded a cryptocurrency and biometrics company called WorldCoin with Sam Altman uh, six years ago. A few years later, found myself with some resources and endeavored to answer the question, how can I invest those usefully? Um, I came to the conclusion that I should start up a tissue engineering lab that sought to uh, solve universal basic human organs, um, develop in vitro organs at a scale that um, could be accessible to everyone for every vital organ. Um, for this talk, I wanted to just simply uh, assert three premises that led to that conclusion. That was my own sort of map down this idea maze. Um, bit high level for this audience and a bit duplicative, so forgive. Um, premise one is that organogenesis as a path to longevity is underrated. Premise two is that in vitro development is the dominant branch on the tech tree to organogenesis. And then premise three is that the technology is just now good enough for us to try. So uh, premise one, that it's underrated, again, I feel like this is sort of more consensus here than others, but to use uh, Jean Hubert's metaphor, we don't um, uh, extend the life of a car by trying to reverse the age of its parts. Rather, we initialize the development of those parts through the same pathways that got us those parts in the first place, and then we uh, hot swap them at the end. Um, we know that nature grows complex tissues. In fact, it does that like robustly across heterogeneous environments. You know, there are case studies of fetuses that develop outside of wombs, right? Like once you go down this organogenesis gradient, they, you know, evolution has made it rather robust. And we know that transplantation works since mid-century. Um, so the first uh, claim was just the sort of the appeal of that like strong epistemic foundations in contrast to reversing the age of tissues, which there's no sort of strong existence proof for. Um, and then the second was just the macro statistics. Um, you know, a third of people die approximately of heart failure. Obviously, that's downstream endemic issues that wouldn't necessarily be resolved by replacement. But you could say something like 20 million uh, heart failures is like a theoretical upper bound on demand. Meanwhile, there's 5,000 heart transplants, right? So 20 million upper bound demand, 5,000 supply. You have a three orders of magnitude, like theoretical gap and you can like fairly estimate, you know, it would be something like curing cancer. It would something like equal the longevity gains of the 20th century if you could scale up that supply. Um, so claim one, organogenesis is underrated. Um, claim two, in vitro development is the dominant path on the tech tree, though I will concede CNS knockout is awesome. <laughs> and I'm quite optimistic about that too. Um, by in vitro development, I mean development, which is by and large seek to let the cells do their own thing um, of developing organs. And then in vitro, I mean engineer an environment where you have full engineering degrees of freedom in order to make that possible. Um, by dominant uh, branch, I mean two things. One is that um, it's the furthest branch. If you think about the end state where you want to get to, I would argue there's three criteria. There's you want it to be biocompatible with the patient. You want to have degrees of engineering freedom to improve the organs over time towards eventually making them superhuman. And then three, you want no rate limiters to scale. Um, and I would say, uh, actually, except for CNS knockout, no other path kind of fulfills all three of those. Um, uh, and then by dominant, I also mean that it's uh, likely to be more possible than other branches, just given the pure bet on development. Um, so you know, br briefly to just explore those other branches, I think the first uh, division in my mental model is between autologous and not. So are you uh, building the organs from the patient's own genetic materials or not? On the not side, there are, uh, you know, first improve the human transplant market. So um, chemical cryo that could extend the lifespan of a heart from like four hours to 48 hours. Um, would allow you to commercially fly them, do better matching. You could probably improve the 
um, human transplant market by factors of two. Um, there's prosthetics, obviously there's pros and cons across different types of organs. So hearts being very functional versus very chemical. Then three, there's xenotransplantation, which is, um, you know, humanize a pig, right? Enough, there's 600 million base pairs, difference between a human and a pig. Uh, some percentage of those code for proteins and sugars that will trigger violent immune rejection. Some percentage of them are endogenous retroviruses. So like get good enough at yanking out enough of those basis pairs to like make it sufficiently tolerable to the patient. So anyways, those are three branches on the non-autologous side. On the autologous side, there's basically scaffolding tech, right? Which is sort of the cargo cult. Like you, you kind of build this morphologically accurate looking thing and uh, then increasingly make it more representative, um, you know, like the plane crashes in the Pacific Island and it's like, it looks like a plane, but now, you know, let's make it function like it. Or uh, chimerism. So genetically modify a host animal embryo like a pig, um, such that it can't develop progenitor cardiomyocyte cells, put in the patient's uh, stem cells. If you think of cells like agentic systems, the embryo seeks to solve the problem of not being able to grow its own heart by recruiting the human stem cells to solve that problem. This works out of the box with mice and rats, like for the pancreas, which is very preserved, um, 10 million years distant on the evolutionary tree. Um, the problem with this method that we concluded is that if it doesn't work out of the box, the cost of iterating across the design space to make it work is just too high because you're, uh, mod you're operating at genetic modification level. Um, it's like assembly code. And you, know, you don't want to be like a human miner traversing a space and not even knowing whether there's gold. Um, so anyways, we, what we ultimately concluded was um, in vitro development, which is roughly um, seek to nucleate a representative cross-section of a tissue and then seek to create an environment that maximizes for the life of that tissue so that it can expand progressively. Um, there's four technologies in the stack. First is blueprinting. So can we understand on a cell-by-cell -cell basis what a cross-section of an organ would look like, what cells where. Two, can we develop protocols to go from mRNA to transcription factors to get each of those cell types? Three, can we build a biomechanical system that can differentiate those cells on a cell-by-cell -cell basis? And then four, can we have some kind of environment with access to the degrees of freedom around uh, hormones, tension, even bioelectricity that will um, approximate the environment of these tissues so they can continue to expand. Um, a nice feature of this finally is like if the sort of go to Mars is organs, there's many lower orbit markets in between. We can seek to create good representative in vitro organoids uh, for toxicity testing, patches, hybrid biofunctionalized prosthetics, and the goal would be to commercialize each of those over time. All right. You forgot to mention stents on the other. Tell me, yeah. <laughs> we'll have a whole talk on that. All right, thank you. Man. Thank you. Uh, all right, don't, don't, don't leave just yet. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. Um, all of the, the nerd of me gets excited talking about all these things about optimizing and making superhuman organs and all this kind of stuff, but um, it sounds a lot more complicated than non sentient clones. Like, a <laughs> lot more complicated. Sure, sure, sure. So, sure. I guess, um, what's the justification for doing something that Gives you the same results, but is much more complicated. <laughs> well, I mean, for, first of all, there are other people doing it, right? So like there's, you know, what's the marginal replacement value of doing a thing someone else is doing? Um, yeah, and I think sec second of all, there are intermediate milestones. So to, to have vascularized tissue organoids that you could use to improve toxicity testing, two, to have patches, uh, there is a therapeutic domain of partial transplantation patches, three to biofunctionalize prosthetics. Like those are good markets to contribute to, even if we don't get to full organs. Um, and then I think the, yeah. And then the sort of sci-fi answer is that like, ultimately you get more degrees of control if you in fact had an environment that could do like organs on a per organ basis. So like, it might be the case that the best heart in hundred year horizons is a hybrid prosthetic with, um, Cool. All right. 
Uh, I think, thank you very much.